Amen. Amen. Father, we just enter into your presence right now. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. And we say, have your perfect way in each and every one of us. Have your way in this service. Have your way in this time. We listen for you. We listen to hear your voice this morning. We welcome the healer into this place. Let your living waters fall on your sons and daughters. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Father. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. This is amazing grace. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. Yeah. This is amazing grace. Yes, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free oh, Jesus I 
sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphans a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Now go ahead, give him another shout of praise. The louder we praise, the more excited we get, the madder the devil gets. And the enemy has to flee when we praise him. So if you're in a crisis situation right now, if there is chaos going on in your world now, the best thing you could ever do is praise him as loud as you can, and it makes the devil downright mad. But he has to flee. That's what God's word says. He has to flee. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So we say, devil, take this in your face. So we throw up our hands and we praise you again and again, God. Because all that I have is a hallelujah. It may not be much, but I have nothing else to give my king. You may think you have nothing to give Jesus today, but let me tell you, you do. It's right here in your own hands. It's right here in your own mouth is to give him a hallelujah. Nothing we can do makes the devil matter than that. So there should be a lot of stomping and jumping and praising God in this house today, amen? Because we're going to give him our hallelujah, amen? I tell you, when before I got um, radically saved, I guess you would say, I thought I was saved, but I, I don't know, you know, um, because the Bible says you know them by their fruit. And if there's no fruit, I don't know. And 
once saved, always saved. I believe that the enemy cannot pluck us out of the devil's hand, but we can take ourselves out of God's hand, okay? So my mama used to tell me, I'd stand there while everybody else in church was going crazy, and I thought, they're a bunch of lunatics, you know? And I would tell my mom, it, it'd been better if you'd raised us like this. You know, I don't understand. They'd take off, and I was thinking it was a distraction. Instead of putting my affection and my thoughts and my heart into him, the one who created me, the one who allowed me to live that long when he should have struck me down years before that. And she looked at me, and she said, Honey, I watch all y'all when football comes on. She says, you yell and scream about like a bunch of lunatics at a man on a TV screen with a ball trying to get to the other end of the field. Why can't you yell and scream for a man that stretched his arms out for you so that you could not only live in eternity with him, but you could experience eternity, heaven on earth. I don't know about you, but I want to experience heaven on earth. And doing the same old thing and expecting something different is insanity. It's insanity. So I'm going to do something different. And I'm telling you, if I was down there with y'all, I'd be on my face, on the floor. Y'all think I was the lunatic, but I don't care. I'll be a lunatic for Jesus. Amen? Because he loved me so much that he died for me. He gave his life for you and me. So when I come into praise and worship, it don't matter what it sounds like. It's not about what it sounds like. It's about my heart and how my heart is aligned with God Almighty, how important he is to me, that I would stretch my hands out and praise God with everything inside me. Because when I was in the world, I gave the world every bit of me. I'm going to give Jesus a million times more of me than I gave the world. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for this time. Holy Spirit, invade this place. We want to have an encounter with you this morning as we enter into your presence. And I say, come on, my soul, don't be shy now. I will lift up my song because there is a lion inside of me. There's a lion inside of you. So, Father, bring that lion out of us this morning as we worship you with everything inside of us. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said? Amen. Amen.
sing so I throw up my hands so I throw up my hands praise you again and all I have is love I know it's not much I've nothing else good for my Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, give him a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated if you can. Praise God. He is so good. Well, welcome to the service. Welcome to those who are watching online. It is time to continue our worship with our tithes and offerings. And uh, those of you who have not been here before, uh, we have a box in the back that you can deposit your million dollars. Uh, we have a place over here on the side where you can put the other. And... Uh, online as you can see so we do appreciate you and uh, we do love that the Lord has everything under control so um, let us pray oh and oh by the way in a moment people are going to get up and they're going to walk all over the place and don't worry nobody did anything wrong uh, so let's pray father we bless you and we thank you you've been so good to us you are an awesome God and so we bless you this morning uh, with our tithes and offerings, and we give you thanks that you have blessed us so much. In Christ's name, amen.
the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above Is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all power and positions your name stands above them all and the angels sing holy all creation Y'all give it up for the praise team. We are blessed beyond measure to have you guys. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you, Pastor. Well, this is the day the Lord hath made, and I will. Welcome to Trinity Family Church. Who's glad to be here this morning? Well, two or three of you are. Welcome to Trinity Family Church. Who's glad to be here this morning? That's better. God is good. One, uh, we're going to try to quit making announcements. And so the announcements are going to be on the slide before church and after church. And uh, you notice there during during your little visitation time. Uh, but we do want to announce, we, we do a poor job of uh, pushing church membership. And so we have these church membership, they're out there on the foyer. Their membership package. There's a lot of good information in here. I would encourage you to get one and read it. And then if you decide you want to join, we'd love to have you become a member of Trinity Family Church. Can I get an amen? It's good to be part of the family of God. It's good to be part of a family. And it's especially good to be part of God's family. Can I get an amen? And so God is in the middle of raising up an army. And uh, we want you to, if you're a born-again believer, we want you to participate in the army of God here on earth. We have our work cut out for us, as you will, if you didn't already know that, you will know it by the end of the service. Amen? And so uh, we're, we're glad you're here. Super glad to have all the visitors. Thank you so much for coming. We pray that you have already felt the presence of God in this place and that you will continue to do so as we go through the service. Right now, if we could have all the children, fifth grade and under, come up to the front. There's one. Come on. The rest of them are already back there. They're cheating. <laughs> Listen, you're supposed to go through the tunnel. Come on, Micah. You can't lead, but you can be second. All right. Let's bless the children. Let's lead, lead the way, Katie. Lord, we just ask you to fill them fresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. Fill them fresh and anew with your word this morning. And we ask you to raise them up to be world changers. In Jesus' name. How many of y'all believe you can be a world changer? Listen, even if you're an adult, you can still be a world changer. Because the way the kingdom works, it's one heart at a time, one soul at a time. You guys, every one of you know people that I will never get to meet. But you can, you can be a blessing to them and you can share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ with those people. Can I get an amen? All right, this morning I'm a little bit excited thought it was. I lost him. There he is. Found him. We are we are blessed beyond measure. I got to tell you all a little story this morning to set this up. 
Uh, we have a guest speaker this morning. His name is Curtis Bowers. He's got his whole family here. He's got Lauren and 41 kids here with him this morning. And uh, listen, I, I, I love that. I finally meet a family that believes in following the commandment of God to uh, furnish and replenish the earth. Can I get an amen? There, the number one way that the kingdom it grows is when a Christian man and a Christian woman have lots of kids, raise them in the fear, the admonition of the Lord. Can I get an amen? And I've been watching his kids this morning, and they are all extremely impressive. They've got great work ethic. They're all kind. They're helpful. Uh, you can tell that they have been raised right. So, Lauren and Curtis, we applaud you on the raising of your kids. You have done well. Now, I also want to say I have never met Curtis until this morning, which is a really unusual situation because I'm really particular about who we let have the pulpit here. But uh, Miss Joanne Fleming, who many of you know, she runs Grassroots America out of Tyler, Texas. She called me about two or three weeks ago, and she said, hey, I've got Curtis Byers coming to speak at my uh, conference this weekend, and he's looking for a church to speak in on Sunday morning. Would you let him come in? Now, I want to tell you, her word is powerful enough with me that that's enough in and of itself, her recommendation. But I said, I really would like to, you know, talk to him and get to know a little bit more about the guy. And so she said, well, go to Amazon, and there, there's two movies he's made. Uh, there, one is called, a, and you may have seen them out there in the foyer. He's, he's got them for sale out there. But Agenda, The Grinding Down of America is one, and Agenda, The Masters of Deceit is another one. And me and Mila watched Masters of Deceit. And after watching it, I felt like I had met my twin brother that I had never met. And so I'm extremely excited he's here. He's got his pulse on what's going on in America, as fine as anybody I've ever met. And uh, you hear a lot of that stuff come through the pulpit here over the years. Uh, and so if you would, give a warm Trinity Family Church welcome to Mr. Curtis Bowers. No. Oh, there we go. Took a second to click into gear. Well, it's nice to be here. Uh, it's a fun thing we've been able to do as a family is travel all over the America, having made some documentary films on what's happened to our country from a Christian perspective and why these things have happened. We, for 10 years, traveled all over America from 2010 to 2020 and uh, got to meet with groups of people in churches and conservative conferences coast to coast to really see America and really get to know America. And I want to encourage you, a lot of people don't get to travel like that. So you think, oh, I'm the only one that thinks like this or the only one that's concerned for my country or whatever. But I'm telling you, there's groups of people in every single town in America that love God that love our country and are very concerned about the condition she is in. And so um, I wanted to share that with you. Yeah, the first film we made was Agenda, Grinding America Down. And I'm going to tell you a, a story about that. But uh, again, those films, and I encourage you to watch them, and maybe the pastor could even have showings at the church here on an off day or something, because they give you a full education over the last hundred years, here's what has happened. And it's important to understand that. Why? Because the Bible says we are supposed to understand the times. A Christian, they're not like, oh, what's going on? A Christian should say, here's what's going on. And here's what we need to be doing to make a difference. They need to understand. They need to know this Bible inside and out. Uh, if you come to church one hour a week <laughs> and think that's going to do it, um, if you only ate one meal a week, you would see how weak you would be physically. <laughs> and if you only have one spiritual meal a week, you're going to be very weak spiritually. And you can't be. You know why you can't be? Because it's a spiritual battle we are in. Okay, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So if you don't have all the armor on, you're finished. And you're going to lose your kids. You're going to lose your grandkids. You're going to, your life is going to be in shambles because you're not doing things God's way. And he's told us how everything is to operate. Everything. 
the family, the church, the state, business, everything. Here's all the, the guidelines. So we need to study that so we know, oh, that's how he wanted a father to be or a mother or a child, how they're supposed to interact with their parents. Or It's all in there. And so I just want to encourage you in that. I'm going to, instead of get into all what's going on in our country, you need to see those movies, and I know your pastor lets you know a lot of that. I instead wanted to encourage you as a Christian to consider if you've ever really given your life to the Lord. It's one thing to, oh, oh I'm saved. I, I, you know, I said that prayer when I was a kid or whatever, but it's another thing to completely surrender and say, no, no, God, I'm done with my way of doing things. I'm going to do it, what you want me to do the rest of my life. And I'm throwing out all my ambitions and stuff because I know you know better than I do. And I'm going to just tell you my personal story of doing that as it, hopefully as encouragement and to remind you the God of the Bible is the same God today. <laughs> okay. He hasn't lost the ability to part the Red Sea or to do whatever. We always think, oh, he was faithful to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. No, he will be faithful to you if you're living in such a way that you're connected, you're listening, and you're obeying. The, the reason obedience is so important is because it says, if you love me, Jesus said this, you will keep my commandments. So you want to know what they are, and you want to be willing to submit your desires for his when you know, no, that's the way I'm showing him that I love him by obeying what he's asked me to do. A few verses before I get into more of a story of just, again, God's faithfulness to me and my family, um, hopefully to inspire you to, to go for the gold for Jesus. Uh, three verses I wanted to share with you. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Think about that. That verse is twice in the book of Proverbs. God repeated that exact statement twice. There is a way that seems right uh, unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Okay? What does that mean? It means a lot of times you can think you're on the right path, but you are not. It seems right, but it is not right. And the Bible is the only way for you to be sure, no, I know it is right because I'm doing what it's asked me to do. So don't allow this world to deceive you. Satan is very good at packaging his items in Christian terminology or Christian cloak it and Christian stuff if he's trying to get to a Christian person. Um, just, and, and, and so you have to be, you, you can't fall for that. Uh, another verse that fits into what I'm going to be talking about is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. That's an amazing promise. I mean, uh, if you think about that, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. God's telling you right there, don't you do what you think is best. You do what I think is best. Because you're going to be deceived so often if you're just going on emotions or going on, well, it sounds good to me, and you haven't prayed about it, you haven't thought about it, you haven't sought wise counsel in pastors and, and people, fathers and things that respect that you respect. Um, so that's a key one. And then the last one that, that will tie into this story is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. That's, uh, that's, to me, probably the greatest verse for a Christian today. All things work together for good. The horrible tragedy you didn't plan on, the, the, the things that you, that you suffered through, no. God says they will all work together for good um, because I love you. And I know we get to see sometimes little glimpses of that here on this earth. But I promise you, when you get to heaven, he will end whatever tragedy in your life or thing you didn't understand on this earth, he will show you, this is what I did with that. And you'll go, I know we will all say this, thank you for allowing that to happen. Even the most horrible thing. Because he, he does not waste your suffering on anything. Nothing. 
Zero. If you're suffering, something wonderful is happening. Um, or he's teaching you, or you're, you're on the wrong path, and he's saying, hey, he's giving you a spanking, and you need to get back and realize, oh, this is my own doing. I, I'm not doing what's right, and so this is correction. This isn't. But he allows his children to suffer even when they're doing what's right because that's his currency that grows us into a mature, loving person that is well-rounded and that has compassion for others because they've suffered themselves and is very loving. When I was 32 years old, I'd been raised in a good family, um, a good Christian family, learning the truth and everything. And at 32, God just brought some problems and things into my life that kind of shook me up. And I started to think about everything. I said, you know, for 32 years, I've been telling God what to do. <laughs> I've been telling him, hey, would you bless my business? Would you do this? <laughs> I've always bossing him around. And I started to realize, what am I thinking? He is God. I'm not. Why am I asking him, what would you have me to do? And I, he just shook me up. I mean, where it was serious, though, I, I meant it. It wasn't a little thing that passed by. I mean, for months then, I was just reading the Bible as many hours a day as I could. So I go, no, I want to do it your way. And I'm sorry for wasting 32 years. Would you please direct my path and make it clear what you want me to do? And I told him, I said, dear God, I will do anything you ask me to do. I just ask you to make it clear so I don't confuse myself on my own desires. Um, but I meant it. Again, I meant it. It wasn't a, anybody can say stuff like that, but you know when you mean it. So I did that. I was in the restaurant business at the time, had a restaurant in Boise, Idaho. We lived in Idaho. And as I was doing that, I just kept praying. And slowly, nothing really changed in my life. It wasn't like instantly he said, go to China or whatever. Uh, I think a lot of people are fearful. He's going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. It, when you submit to him, you want to do what he's asked you to do because you know he is God. <laughs> and he knows exactly why he knit you together inside of your mother's womb. He had a plan. And I think most of us, most Christians, have never asked him, what's the plan? They, they've just done what they want to do. They have their plan. Here's all the things I'm going to do in life. God just bless what I'm doing. They don't ever say, no, no, no. I'm here for you, not for me. What do you want me to do? And that's what I would encourage you in. So for the next couple years, he just was working on my heart. I just had such a hunger for God's word and for everything, and God was blessing us with children, and my heart for my family. God, like he says in, in Malachi there, he turned the hearts of the fathers to the children. All of a sudden, I was just overwhelmed with, these are children he's given me. I need to spend time, I mean, a lot of time with them, building a relationship, but then teaching them all the things I've learned in my life so they don't have to learn things the hard way like I did. I don't want that for them. I want them to, to be far ahead because they've got the wisdom of an older man they've absorbed when they're young. So they know, oh no, that's hot. If you touch it, it burns you or whatever it is. They would know those things. And so God really started working on that. And I started to have a burden to come home. I was like, oh, I need to come home to my family. Now, I don't know what I'm supposed to do or anything, but I just, I just it was just this desire. I keep praying, God, I'd be happy to come home, but you, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I would love to come home and spend more time with my family. Um, he had convicted us at the same time. We only had one little girl to start homeschooling her. Um, and so we started that, but then God kept blessing more and more children. And so it was about two years after I'd first just been all in and given God my life. I said, it is yours. Tell me what to do. Um, that one night I'm in the restaurant and a man came in and he asked to talk to the owner. And so they came and got me. I was in the kitchen and uh, yes, I came out and he said, would you sell me this place? Now, it wasn't for sale or anything. And I thought, that's funny. I said, uh, are you, do you want to be in the restaurant business? He said, no. <laughs> I said, what do you want the place for? He goes, I'm going to tear everything out of here and put my office in here. It was a very beautiful location. It was on the second story of a building with a balcony that wrapped all the way around it in downtown Boise. So it overlooked the Capitol Dome. It was right there where you're sitting on the balcony. You could see the lit up Capitol at night and everything. And he was just going to tear everything out of there and put his, uh, put his office in there because it was so pretty. And the mountains were in the background, the Boise Mountains and everything. And so all of a sudden I just realized, oh, 
God, you're letting me out. And he's like, yep, it's time to come home. And I just sense, I totally, oh, this is God, this is of God. So I realized I'm supposed to do this. And so we worked out a deal and came home. Now, um, I was so excited to come home because I knew God had a plan, but I didn't know what it was yet. So it's a little different when you quit your job, you got a bunch of kids and, a, and, and you're just there. But for about six months, I didn't do anything except play with the kids I was so grateful to be home, and I had been working very hard for about 15 years in the restaurant business. Um, and so, but, but here's what's so interesting. And, and when you say, I'm following you, he obviously has the plan. And so he'll let you know the plan when you need to know it. So, so you can rest in that, though. No, I, I rest, I go, no, God brought me home. I mean, <laughs> clearly, so I know he has something for me to do, but I don't know what it is. So, uh, you know, but... Also something that had happened when I came home, I had been working nights for 15 years because the restaurant is evening thing. Um, I realized, you know what? It's so easy for us as Christians to complain about our elected officials, you know, I don't ever do anything right or whatever. And I thought, I need to go to the Republican monthly meetings. They met one hour a month in our county, Canyon County. And so I found out when that was. I would felt guilty a little bit because I'd never been because I was always working in the evening. So I started going to those meetings once a month. And I brought all the kids, which was fun. They were so excited for me to be there because I don't know if you've ever been to a Republican meeting, but there's no one under 50 in the room. <laughs> uh, so, so having all these kids there, they were all excited. To, so it kind of gave me a good end to get to know them. And I, the only reason I'd gone to those meetings I did not go to, with anticipation or wanting to be a representative or be in politics. I really despise that. I was like, no way. I went to those meetings, and this is why Christians should be at those type of meetings, because I wanted to be there so if someone stood up and said something or recommended something that was good, I, as another man, could raise my hand and say, I think that's a great idea, and for these reasons. I was there to stand up for the truth. And if someone stood up and said, we should do this or that, and I know that's not good, I'm going to say, um, sorry to disagree, but I do not think that's a good idea for these reasons. And I just wanted to be a little light there in there to help keep the Republican Party going the right direction instead of drifting like it's been doing. That's why I went. Well, God is funny in that he, he, he has a different path for you probably than the one you're on. That's what I found out. It's so funny. He, but I realized he knit you together. He knows what he designed you to do. And I think most people never do what he designed them to do. I just, I just think that's the way it is because we never even think about that. So I've been going to these meetings and for 10 months or so. And all of a sudden, our state representative who was no good, he was a Republican, but he was pro-choice, he was just no good at all. He gets elected, there's an election, and then he steps down just shortly thereafter because he, had, he found out he had a heart condition. So this seat opens up, and I remember it was in the paper on the table in our dining room, and I, I told my wife, I walked by, I saw that, I go, man, I hope we get a decent person this time, because I'd always been complaining about him and everything. And she said, you ought to do it. I said, oh, no, no, I'm not the politician type guy. I can't do that. But I'd already learned earlier, no, no, I'm not the boss. And so I said, oh, I need to be willing. And I started praying, God, is there any way you would want me to do that when I, I really don't want to? Um, but, but, I'm, but if you want me to, I do, because um, I know you'll help me. And I started to be convicted. Yeah, a Christian man's got to at least be willing to stand up and, and make a difference. So I found out, how do you get your name put in the hat and all this stuff, and went through all that, and there was eight people wanting to get this position. And they had us come in, and they, we each had to give a speech before the committee, and then they grilled us with questions, and then they sent a list of names to the governor. A first choice, a second choice, and a third choice. I just made choice number three. I just barely made the list. And... Our governor was a Republican governor, and this was a Republican committee, so he always picks number one because he doesn't want to slap the face of the people that he <laughs> elected him to office. But he had 14 days to decide who to pick. 
And on day number 14, I remember the phone rang at our house, and I went and answered it. And I said, hello, and, and a voice came on, is Curtis there? And I go, yes, this is Curtis. He goes, this is Governor Otter. And I said, oh, nice to speak with you. He said, you probably wonder what you're doing in January. And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, I want you to be on our team. Um, and all of a sudden, I realized so many people that so want those positions. I'd met so many people going to the monthly meeting that have run every single time there's an election for decades, you know, trying to get one of these. They're just so hungry for that position. I didn't want the position. And God said, I want you to have the position because I have a purpose in giving you the position. I didn't know what it was at the time. So all of a sudden, I'm a representative just thrown into this thing. We'd only lived in the district for two years, so we didn't know anybody. And we lived rural where, you know, you got a home every half mile, you know, so we knew like two of our neighbors. Um, so what I started doing is I started writing a letter to the editor each month on a different um, issue, different uh, um, thing that, that so people would start to know who I am and what I believe in, so on a different thing going on. And so I did that. And as the months went by, it, was, it became January of 2008, and my wife was pregnant with Chapman, who's back here with us. And she said, could you not write on anything controversial this month? I'd, I'd rather you not be on the headlines of the paper when I go into the hospital. The nurses might be mean to me or something. You know? <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, okay, I won't, I won't write on anything controversial this month. You know, just, um, and she was concerned. And what's so funny, God has such a great sense of humor I was going to write on Roe v. Wade because it was the anniversary in January and stuff. And I, okay, I won't write on that. What I wrote on was a meeting I had gone to in 1992. And God blinded us to the fact that it would be the most controversial thing you could ever write on. But what it was, in 1992, my father had a friend who had studied communism back in the 50s and 60s and written some famous books on that. And... He saw that in the summer of 1992, the Communist Party USA was having a meeting at the University of California, Berkeley, which is interesting. He's like, what are they doing? Now, put yourself back then. Remember, in 1989, the Berlin Wall had come down, you know, and then in, in the December of 91, the Soviet Union had dissolved, so the whole world was saying communism's over. But six months later, he saw, wait, the... the the communists are having a meeting, and he called, and he said, would you go to that for me? He goes, I can't go because they'll know who I am. I've written all these books on communism, but can you go and just listen? I'm curious what they're talking about. So I thought, oh, sure, that sounds fun. I was in graduate school, and I thought, I'll go and see what happens. So I went. I bought some goofy T-shirt, you know, we need a revolution or whatever, because I thought it would be all college radicals, you know, at Berkeley of all places. So I flew out there. I get there. And I walk into the first, it was a three-day meeting where there was 12 hours a day of breakout sessions and all this stuff. I walk into the auditorium, and there's probably 13 or 1,400 people there. And they're all 50, 60, and 70-year-olds with briefcases. And I thought, oh, this is totally different than what I thought. I was probably the youngest person there. It was all older people. Anyway, for three days, I sat there, and they talked through, here's what we're going to do to take America down. And they had three primary targets, the family, our free enterprise system, and our morality. Those are three things they said we've got to, and they talked about those things. They were like a pastor up there, I mean, pounding the pulpit, sweat, I can still put this one guy, sweat coming down. The family is the most evil thing ever invented by men to enslave women and brainwash children. That's what they thought the family was all about. And, and then they would talk about morality, how nonsense, we should be able to do anything we want to do whenever we want to do it. And the free markets only make the rich richer and the poor poor, you know, all this stuff. But here's what they said. To, to continue to dissolve the family, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing, but really get behind the feminist movement to make women discontent with marriage and motherhood. We need to get where eventually nobody's getting married, where they're just, that's not happening. And then they said, we need to keep pushing pre, pre, pre-K programs. Anything to get the children away from the parents at the earliest age possible. We want to raise the children. That was, I mean, the whole focus was we need the children. We could care less about the adults. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. They knew that statement was true, and that was their agenda. They said, 
when children are around parents, they learn religious nonsense and patriotism. And we cannot allow either one of those. And so that's what they wanted. They just wanted those children. So make women feel, oh, you can't stay home. Go do something with your life. Because they wanted that job that's so vital to civilization. Um, so then they said for the free markets. Now, again, this is 1992. Try to put yourself, that's 31 years ago. Okay, here's what they said. Now, at the time, I didn't even get it. I was like, how would you do this? But they said, we feel the only thing that will be able to destroy the free markets in America, the free enterprise system, is if we really get behind the environmental movement. Um, it's going to be able to create enough regulation and red tape so business will just leave America and it will collapse economically. That's what they wanted so then they could implement a socialist society. And back then, again, the environmental movement was not a big thing. It is today, obviously. It was not then. It was a fringe group of you know, tree huggers in Oregon chaining themselves to trees so they wouldn't be cut down. So it was not mainstream at all. I even wrote my notes, how would you do that? Big question mark. What? Environmentalism and you're going to stop McDonald's or whatever. You know, it didn't make any sense. But we see today, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Um, and the last thing was this, morality. They said the fabric of morality, we need to just undo that once and for all. Where people... There's no moral standards of anything because those are all man-made um, and they're enslaving to mankind. And they said, we think the only thing that will do that is if we can get Americans to accept homosexuality, there'll be no more discussions of morality. This is 92 and that was still kind of a, a, a joke. It was not mainstream either. And... Uh, so I wrote that in a letter to the editor. Here's, I went to a communist meeting 16 years ago. Here's the things they said. And I just went through just like I went for you. At the end, the only thing I said was a couple sentences at the end. I go, look where we are today. It's time to wake up. <laughs> and all of a sudden, needless to say, when we delivered, we went to the hospital for Chapman. It was my eighth straight day as the headlines of the paper. Um, <laughs> There was protests at the Capitol demanding I resign, all this foolishness. And, and the paper, the local paper there said, we got more responses to your letter to the editor than anything we've ever published in our 100-year history. Um, they even put, they printed 47 responses to it, but they said they received hundreds more than that. Well, here's what happened. Most of the people were in, totally in my favor going, he's absolutely right. But one man was specific. He said, what Representative Bauer says is true, but it's nothing new. It was all written in a book in 1958. And I called and got to know him. He became a good friend. What book is it? He said, oh, it's The Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen. And I got that book. So I'm getting the book in 2008. It was written in 1958. Fifty years later, I'm opening it for the first time. And in the back of it, uh, Cleon Skousen had been an FBI agent, and he had gathered together all the notes from all the FBI agents in America that had gone undercover into communist cells all over the country, just listening. What are they talking about? What are they doing to us? And he had compiled a list. Here's the 45 main things, as of 1950s, that the communists are talking about in their meetings they want to do to us to take us down from within. I'm just going to read a couple of them to you. But again, this is 50s America. You know, Andy Griffin, you know, if, if you're some of you young people, if you don't know what that looked like, it was so different than today, you cannot even imagine it. Goal number 17, look at what you're dealing with in Texas in your educational system. Get control of the schools, use them as transmission belts for socialism, it means teach socialist ideas so they're accepted, so the young people think, oh, that socialism's good. Soften the curriculum, dumb them down, and get control of teachers' associations. They've done all that decades ago. That's why it's so radical. It's not just a little bit. It's like they're pushing, openly pushing things that destroy the children. Now, as a Christian, when I read this, I thought, these are the communists. How do they, they're atheistic in their thinking, how do they get that our morality is our greatest strength? And we don't seem to get that. Listen to some of these. When I read through some of these, I was just shocked. Goal 24. This is 1950s America. 
Eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship in a violation of free speech and free press. They want an obscene culture because it will eventually collapse on itself. A quick story on that. Pastor, how long do I have? So I, uh, thank you. We'll be out by one. Um, <laughs> just tease it. But listen to this. It's so important. You need to understand these things because it helps you realize your, your need to be informed, your need to be active, your need to be standing for the truth, speaking the truth, and living the truth. But here, here's what's happened. I know all of you know, oh yeah, a lot of things have changed, especially some of you that are older. But I don't think we realize how dramatically. In the early 1970s, I went to the grocery, or, or to the department store with my mother. And she was going to buy some ladies' things. And so that's one thing that's funny how much we've changed. They would never have allowed a young boy into the ladies' department because you might see something ladies wear, and that would be totally defiling to, to a young boy. Now it's, you know, it's all in your face. But back then, so I had to wait outside on the, on the sidewalk. And I'm standing outside the door, probably seven or eight years old, waiting for my mother. And I remember this like it was yesterday because I was scared to death with what happened. As I was standing there waiting for her, a man on the other side of the doorway w was a really rough character. Um, he was tattooed head to toe, which in early 70s, that was not normal. <laughs> uh, now it's more, but it was not at all. He was just rough, and he was talking to another guy, and I was just kind of scared, you know, as I'm standing there waiting because I hear them. While he was talking to the other gentleman, he used the word hell. And everyone goes, so? Well, Here's what happened. A couple minutes later, I remember when he looked over and saw me, and I remember when he saw me, I got scared because I didn't know, and he walked over and he put his face right in my face, and I, I can still picture what he looked like, and he said this, son, I'm so sorry for saying that. I didn't see you standing there. That's how much we've changed. He knew you don't use the word hell in front of a child or a lady. He might talk that way with his buddies around the corner in the, the back alley, but you don't do that in public. And he apologized to me for that. That's how far we, we've come so far, we don't even comprehend it. Goal 25, listen to this. Boy, they have been successful in this area. Break down the cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. Do you understand the cover of any woman's magazine at Walmart today that's right there at face level of all your children and grandchildren? Any of those would have, in 1950s America, be considered triple X pornography, and you would have gone to prison if you tried to distribute it. And now it's just right there. The obscene things they talk about on the covers, everything else, that would have been triple X. Well, they knew. But which I was shocked, a communist center saying, no, you get pornography, you're going to get immorality. And you get immorality, you're going to get families falling apart. And you get families falling apart, the state will have to raise the children. And that's what we want. That's what it was all about. And they got it. Goal 26, which also showed the goals I'd heard at that meeting were nothing new. Present homosexuality as normal, natural, healthy. How is it presented today? I couldn't pick three words that would better define how it's presented. It's normal, it's natural, it's healthy. Pastor, here's the one that pastors are always interested in. 27, infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion and discredit the Bible. They wanted a do-gooder club. Don't worry about this. There's some fun old stories. Some of them are true, some aren't. But just, just come. We're going to go feed the poor. And so you feel good being lost. And you feel good about yourself. And you want to look good to others and feel good. And that's what so much of the church has become today. But they had a plan in doing that. They said, that's what we got to do. Um, there, there's so much I could go into that because I've studied these things for decades. But there were some committees in Congress in the 1950s where one of the top leaders of the Communist Party left because he started to realize Stalin was slaughtering people in the Soviet Union, and he kind of woke up out of his a dreamland thinking communism was going to create a utopia. So they interviewed him before Congress and investigated what's going on. They go, what have you been doing in America? And he'd been one of the leaders of the Communist Party USA 
the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and then all of a sudden he was disillusioned and left. And he came in there and he said this. He goes, the number one thing we've been doing since the early 1930s, because we have so limited people involved, we've gone into the seminaries to get our degrees and then stay on as the professors to train the pastors. He goes, that's the number one thing we've been doing. That's why most of our seminaries today do not believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Only a couple of all the seminaries in America believe this is God's word, it's perfect, it's without error. That's how successful they've been. <laughs> um, and on and on it goes, there's so many of those. But I read those, I was shaken up, I was mad. I was like, you gotta be kidding. Your enemy gives you a list of what they wanna do to you? and you let them do it, I was just, I was boiling. I remember I was beet red. I was like, okay, and, I, and God started to burden my heart with this. And I thought, people need to know about this. People need to know there's an enemy within that is obviously, whether we want to face or they have to be many in number and in powerful positions because you can't accomplish a list like this unless you have influence. <laughs> so you can say, well, there's no such thing as a common... Well, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. And so, anyway, God started to stir my heart. And I started praying, God, how could I let people know about this? And I thought, oh, maybe I could write a book, but I'm not that great a writer. And I thought, oh, people don't read much anymore. And slowly he started to press on my heart that it needed to be a film. And I thought, okay, I need to find someone that could make a film. But I didn't know anybody that made a film. And months go by. And, and I'm just still praying about, God, what do you want me to do with this? Because it just laid so heavy on my heart. And I got an email one day from a group in Texas um, down in San Antonio. They were having a, a Christian film academy, kind of like the basics of filmmaking. It was like a three-day thing. And I thought, right when I opened that email, I go, I need to go to that. And I just felt God wanted me to go. And when I go, I just prayed up the next few months until it it came about, I pray, God, while I'm there, just let me know yes or no. Am I supposed to do this or am I not supposed to do this? And while I was there, I just, I talked to so many different, especially young, young homeschoolers and stuff that were totally in the film. They were 18 years old, but they knew everything. And I just asked them questions. If I was to make a film, what camera should I get in this price range? And what software should I use? And what computer system? And I, I just got all the information I could get from them. And by the time I was done there, and I saw these young people are doing, making good stuff, so this isn't something you have to have studied for 30 years to do, um, I felt, okay, God, I think you want me to do this. So I, came, we, I flew home from there, and when I got home, my, my family knew that's why I'd gone to see if God wanted me to make a film. And I got the family all around together, and I said, family, our next project is we're going to make a movie. And my wife was like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, yeah, I am. And so that night, while we were saying our prayers, it's, it's so sweet how God uses the faith of children to just do amazing things. But we're, we're going around saying our prayers. And it comes to Christian. He's not here, but he was five years old, and it came to his turn to pray. And he said this. He'd heard, Daddy just said, we're going to make a movie. And he had heard us talk about a month before about this big conservative Christian film festival in Texas that had this $100,000 grand prize. Um, we talked about it because we thought, oh, that's so neat that Christian conservatives are doing something meaningful like that, trying to help good films. So we talked about that. He heard that. Then he heard his daddy's going to make a film. And that little five-year-old mind connected that together. And so it came to his turn to pray. And he goes, dear God, help Papa's film to win the festival. <laughs> And we all started rolling. We were laughing so hard. We're like, is he talking about that film festival? We just laughed and we went to bed. A couple days later, Carolina, who was my oldest, she was 14 at the time, she came to me and said, Daddy, why don't we fast and pray this Friday that your film wins that festival? And I was like, oh. you know, sweetie, I haven't bought a camera. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't have a script. I go, but that's a good thing to do. So, oh, yeah, let's do that. So we fasted and prayed, dear God, help the film we haven't even started on. I have no background in film. I don't know anything about film. Help it to win the, the largest single cash prize film festival in America. You know, okay, yeah, thank you. And we did it. 
the next Friday I came down for breakfast and Carolina was in charge of breakfasts and there were no breakfast. I said, sweetie, where's breakfast? She goes, oh, daddy, it's Friday. And I said, oh, are we going to fast this week too? She said, daddy, we're fasting every week until it wins. <laughs> <laughs> so we started doing that. Every Friday we would fast and pray, God, praying God's blessing on this film. But my wife starts calling up all the people I'd read books and articles by on this subject that I knew knew so much and started setting up appointments. And, and while she was doing that, we realized we need to learn how to make a movie. So what we did, we didn't have access to anyone. We thought, okay, we're going to learn from people that know how to do it by watching what they have done. And we started thinking of every good documentary we'd ever seen, we'd watch it over and over again and go, why is it good? Why, when you watch it, you go, man, that was fantastic. And then other documentaries, we'd pop in, and we'd hit eject in five minutes. Why did we hit eject? I, I took hundreds of pages of notes. No, why did we hit? We don't want them to hit eject on our movie. We've got to have them watch it because it's important. And so we studied, and, and then we, my daughters, I bought a DVD, how to set up lights for an interview. <laughs> and I gave it to my daughters, 12 and 14, figure this out. <laughs> Go, go watch this three or four times, take notes, and then we're going to start practicing in different rooms of the house, setting it up and taking it down, setting it up. And for 30 days, every day during the day, we would do interviews with different children in different rooms, practicing our filmmaking, and then we'd watch them back at night. And at the beginning, boy, they were bad. You're like, damn, there's a shadow right across the face, or you know, all these things. But on day 30, we sat down and watched them, and we said, that looks like the movies we've just watched. We know what we're doing. And so we started going to interview. And we got all the interviews. And um, I, I didn't know how to edit or anything. Of course, I didn't even know how to work the software. They told me which software to get, Final Cut Pro, um, an Apple computer. So I bought an Apple computer, never had an Apple computer before. And I didn't know how to do it. I couldn't figure out how to even do the basic stuff. So I found there was a local church in Boise, their Calvary Chapel, they had a multimedia department. I said, do you know anyone there? And there was a young man that goes, oh, yeah, I do put stuff together for our church all the time. I said, can I hire you to just come to my home and show me the basics of how to cut and paste and do things? And so he came. And uh, he'd come on Mondays once a week for, for several weeks, just spending a couple hours with me showing the basics of what the buttons meant and everything so I would learn how to do it. So we start doing it. And what was amazing is... I've probably been working now one year full time. That's all I'm doing. I don't have a job or anything. I'm, our savings is going down and I'm making a film because God told me to. And, um, and I'm working really hard and I'm putting some good things together. But about 12 months into it, all of a sudden I go, wait a minute. I got a big problem here. I realize now over the last month, I've been working very diligently, but it's not getting any closer to being done. It's just kind of moving things and stuff, but it's not like, it's not coming together. A movie is telling a story, and you have to flow in a logical pattern. You have to connect dots. You have to, you, there's so much to it. It's amazing. As I studied, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is, I, one man can't do it. We always laugh now when we watch a movie, all the credits, we go, those people were smart. <laughs> they got 100 people to help them in this. I go, we didn't know anyone, so we did the 100% of it ourselves, from the music to the lighting to the filming to the editing to the everything, um, graphics, and we had to learn all that as we went. It was a great homeschool project. Um, and so, but I realized, wait a minute, I'm not getting closer to being done. And I got, for the first time, I started to question. I go, now God, you told me to do this, but I don't think I'm capable. I don't think I'm, I can do this. This is a huge task. And I started to be really concerned. And I'd learned you need to go to God when you have big burdens that you can't bear. And so I, I remember the, with the family, it was on a Friday morning, I said, I'm going to fast for a week, and I'd never done that before because I really need God to help me with what I'm doing, with giving me clear direction on how to lay this thing out. Um, and so the kids knew that, and, 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 and I said, next Friday night, I'll eat dinner, you know, whatever. So I started fasting and praying and working on the thing. Uh, what, day one goes by, two, three, four. Nothing is happening. I'm still just as foggy as a, I just, 
God, what do you want me to do? And you know, every day I would come over to eat lunch. My office was above our garage. I'd come over and eat lunch with the kids while they were having lunch between homeschool stuff. And they say, did God tell you anything? You know, I go, not yet, <laughs> you know, not yet. And finally it's day five and day six. And I almost gave up. I remember I was like, I don't think it's going to happen. And I'd made up my mind. I go, if I don't know, then I'm going to stop. I got to go try to find a job or something because I'm going to run out of money here, still not have a film done, and we're going to be in trouble. But I didn't. Don't ever give up on God. He does everything perfect in exact right time. Don't you ever give up on him. He is faithful, and he cannot be anything else. He cannot. It's impossible. So I went over in my office. I got down on my knees for two or three hours. Just God help me. Help me. I'm trying to obey, but I, I'm just not smart enough. I'm not capable enough to do this. I don't know what to do. And I was just burdened. And it was literally 4.30 on Friday. Dinner's at 5. It's been a week of it. All of a sudden, he had the clouds part. My mind became so crystal clear. I'm like, Oh, okay. I started grabbing for a paper and pen. I didn't want it to vaporize before. Okay, first start this part of the story, then do this, then three, then it was just like clear. It's following like all my thoughts and things. God just brought them together and I just wrote down a list. Okay, first do this, then this, then this, and, and at the end wrap up with this and do whatever. And it did it. And I came over and the kids said, did God tell you anything? I said, yeah, he did. And it was so sweet because it still took me another eight months or so of editing to get it laid out like that. But that is what the movie is today. Now, we've been fasting and praying still every month. Well, finally, I entered the film in that film festival that we'd been praying about. There was hundreds of films that were entered. And we flew from Idaho to San Antonio for that. And uh, we go to their awards ceremony. And there's thousands of people there. And uh, they come to the very last thing of the evening, the, the best of festival with $101,000 grand prize and everything. And we're all there. And they call that agenda, grinding America down. And it won. <laughs> the first film we'd ever made in our life. But God had told us to make a film. And he will never ask you to do something he will not equip you to be able to do. He won't. And what's so funny to me, a couple parts of this is he knew how he knit me together. You're going to really like making a movie. It's so challenging. I would never have known that. I've never done that in my entire life if he wouldn't have asked me to. But I did like it. It's the most challenging thing. It's the most whole brain activity there is of anything that is out there. Because it's, it's timing, it's music, it's, it's content, it's, it's like overwhelming. I think about it now, I'm like, God, how'd you do that through me? I don't even understand. But so we win that award, we walk off the stage, and I say to my kids and everybody there, I said, the kids, I said, I can't believe God did this. And my daughter Carolina said, Daddy, I knew the first day we fasted he was going to do this. And I said, that's why he did it. And I gave the word to my children. I said, this is for you to always remember God is God. And he can't answer prayers. And he can do the impossible. Anytime he wants to do the impossible, you just have to make sure you're doing his plan instead of your plan. And when you're submissive, his plans don't ever fail. <laughs> so if you're part of his plans, it's succeeding 100% of the time, even when it doesn't look like it's succeeding. That You, you have to know that. So in wrapping up here, there's so many other details to tell. But since that day, God has blessed the film so tremendously. We were in Idaho there. And so we had a day of Thanksgiving. We made, it was July. We made turkey dinner and everything. We were so grateful to be done. Um, and, and while during, at the end of that day, all of a sudden, we started to realize something. It's great we're done, but how in the world do we get this out to anybody? We live in rural Idaho with 10 friends or whatever. What, what, what do we do? 
And it was all, all of a sudden a burden, but we instantly knew, no, he had taught us so much from that fasting and praying. You come to me if you have a problem. Just remember that. You have a problem, don't whine to your friends. Come to him. <laughs> Get on your knees, God help me. God help me. And be faithful in that, knowing he will answer at the right place and the right time. Um, so we go, wait a minute. And it started to be a burden. I was feeling that pressure like, oh my goodness, yeah, we're done, but that doesn't mean anything. If you can't get anybody to see it, you're, it's a waste of time. So we, we knelt down on the floor right at that moment in the living room. No, no, come in here. We all got down on the floor. We had our little DVD we'd finished. And we said, God, we obeyed. We're giving you our loaves and fishes. You feed the 5,000. We're asking you to do that. And I could sit here for so long and tell you so many stories about what he has done with that film. Just online, he had over 25 million people in America watch it. Uh, we've had hundreds of thousands of showings all over America. Um, we had 100,000 people come to our website just to have showings at their churches and homes. We've had, I mean, it's just gone all over. The, the country of Brazil, a couple years ago, and I'll, just, I'll wrap up here, but this was so interesting because it shows you God doesn't always let you see everything he's doing with your little loaves and fishes. But I promise you, he's doing something with them, okay? You might not get to see the people sit down and eat, but if you gave him them, he did something tremendous with them. So just know that. So don't ever get discouraged. Well, oh, it didn't seem to make a difference. That's Satan telling you that. It always makes a difference when you do what is right, when you stand for what is right. I mean, it always makes a difference when you share the gospel with the person that goes, I don't, I'm not interested in that. That's probably your most effective one because that means it was convicting his heart when he said, I'm not interested in that. And who knows, later he might get saved because that'll keep burdening him until he finally submits. So, but this is just one story from a gen, and there's so many. To a couple years ago, I had this TV station in Brazil want to interview me. I thought, that's into it. Why would they want to? And so I, I was on the, the show, and I said, why are you wanting to interview me? And they said, oh, because of agenda. You know, in Brazil, they speak Portuguese. I'm like, uh... Well, how do you know about Agenda? And the, now, the TV announcer said, everyone in Brazil has watched Agenda. And he goes, a professor so-and-so translated into Portuguese and every church in Brazil has had showings of it. Every, the whole, he goes, that's part of the, we've had a revival here the last 10 years. That's how Bolsonaro became elected, everything from Agenda. It woke the whole country up to what was happening. We were being taken over by the communists. And I'm just sitting there going, I didn't have anything to do with that. God, God did that completely. And I thought, isn't that amazing? I go, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and so many other things I could say, but I just, I want to tell you this and leave you with this. God is still God today. And he loves you just as much as he loved Daniel or any of the great people we look back on. You have to know that. I think we always separate out the Bible. Oh, these great men of God, and they were great men. But, but did he just love them more than, no. I, I, I think we don't see a lot of this stuff happening because we're not ever saying, God, what do you want me to do? Where he will then put you in a position where you're not capable of doing what he's asked. So he has to part the Red Sea. When Moses was up against the Red Sea and the armies of the Egyptians were coming, there's nothing he could do, and that's exactly where God wants you where you go, I can't do anything. He goes, exactly. Would you please lift up your rod and ask me? <laughs> I'll do something. So I just, I want to encourage you that because I feel half the reason we're losing the battle in America is because the other side is listening to their commander in chief who is Satan, whether they know it or not. And they're marching to his drumbeat and they're involved in all his evil schemes and plans. And I think hardly any in America are saying, God, what would you have me to do? We're not listening to our commander-in-chief who has a plan and is capable of doing anything, anytime with anybody, and he loves his children tremendously. He spared the, the huge cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He would have if there would have been 10 righteous. I believe in my heart if Abraham would have had the courage to go down, God, if there's one righteous, would you? Spare? he would have said, yes, I will. Um, and so I just, I, I just want to encourage you that we, 
we need to remember God is God. You are not on this earth for fun and games. You are on this earth to glorify him in everything that you do, being different in every area of your life possible. So you're a bright light so they see, why are you different? How come you don't talk like we do? How come you don't do the, watch the same movies? How come you, and you can tell them why. Because Jesus has totally changed me. And, and so you can tell them that. All right, a couple verses here, and I'm done. In Psalm 91, I know you're familiar with it. It's a great chapter to read. If you're ever discouraged or ever, ever, I don't know, you feel, oh, God, what am I doing? And here's what it says. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, COVID. <laughs> you don't have to fear, God, you're not dying a day before God wants you to die. And if you're being obedient, I was, you know, Christians are the people, whether it's AIDS patients or leprosy people, or what, they're going in to hug the people that are dying of something, not to be fearful hiding in their homes. Oh, I might die. No, that's the time the church goes out. When everyone else goes in, we go out. And say, if I get COVID and die, big deal. If you ever die doing what God has asked you to do, you know what that means? It was your time. <laughs> so it's like, and, and I, I tell you, even no matter how much we as Christians hang on to this world, when you see one glimmer of Jesus or heaven, you'll go, why in the world was I wanting to stay down there any longer? <laughs> and just trying to, for no reason. If you're serving him, it's vital to be here. But if you're just wasting your time, it's not. <laughs> um, anyway, and then toward the end, I love this, because then it's God. That was David talking at the beginning. And then at the end, it's God talking to David. And this is what he says. God says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? Amen. Don't forget who God is. This world is doing everything possible to have you come out and play and have you waste your precious time that you're on this earth. That's the greatest, most valuable thing you have, and you don't know how much is left, and neither do I. And I know this on the day we see Jesus' face, all of us will say, why didn't I spend every second doing what he would want me to do instead of what I wanted to do? He had paradise forever planned for me, the fun and games forever of just joy and peace and love and fellowship for all eternity, and I wouldn't give my little vapor to him, my little nothing, that's all he asked, just give it to me. And I'll tell you this, being older now and having lived and watched, the amazing thing is when you give it to him, your life's even better on this earth. You're not sacrificing anything. <laughs> so don't buy into the lies, the culture, the nonsense, Everything's trying to seduce you into disobedience. Everything's trying to seduce you into wasting your most precious resource. But we're on this earth for a purpose. And we need to be fulfilling that in whatever way, wherever he's placed us, to be faithful, to spread the truth, share the gospel, give people tracts, pray for those in need, those that are being persecuted all over the world. There's so many things to fill your time that are so meaningful and will change eternity and change reality. God listens to the prayers of his people.
and I, and I love the story too, when Moses got God to change his mind about why people, I go, wow, God loves us so much when someone that is a follower of him and that has been faithful to him says, God, don't you destroy these people. No, I don't want you to start with me. I would, you don't do that. God says, okay, I won't. <laughs> that's, he's a special God that's hard to comprehend. But I just, I thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to be here. Um, this church right here in this area, if each of you are faithful and prayerful, you could have such a huge impact. You know, I mean, such, if you would just dedicate each day, you know, where you're ready to be used by him, the guy sitting on the sidewalk, go sit down next to him and just talk to him. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Here, I wanted to tell you about something that's important to me. Do you mind? Oh, sure. What is it? I mean, just it's all these little things. If you're faithful in those, each one of those are giving God the loaves and fishes. And I know we're going to see the difference in heaven and realize, man, I wish I'd have been more active in doing that. But, Pastor, I don't know if you want to close things up. But thank you so much. Uh, we do have a table out there of the movies that we made that are, if you haven't seen them, they're so important to help you come up to speed without having to spend years studying. You'll get what's going on. We've got some good books that, that are motivational too and, and understanding the times. And then I have a thing I do each week. It's called agendaweekly.com. And I, each week on Friday night, I, I make a video talking about something going on in the country for 30 or 45 minutes. I talk about that. And then we have an email you get that has, here's all the news items of the week. All the bad news that happened, all the good news that happened, and then prayer and action items. Here's things to be praying about. Here's things to be doing because Christians must be active. And it just comes out every week. And our heart in doing that, we thought, we want Christians to have the time to do something meaningful. Um, and so we're going to take our whole week, figure out here's what's going on, here's all the key things to know about, read through this, take a little bit of time, and then you're ready to go. You don't have to sit there and watch the news, you know, 30 hours a week trying to figure out what's going on. When half the time, even when you do that, you still don't know because you get so many mixed messages. So that's what, that's our ministry as a family. It's $5 a month, but that's what supports us to be able to travel, to speak. Uh, we do family camps and different things around trying to build families up the way God intended them to be because I believe God had the, the family and the church healthy and strong together changes the world. I don't know about you, but I heard so many um, calling points during that message. God's calling us to be obedient. Are you as obedient as you, are you satisfied with your obedience? Does it need to improve? I've asked Scarlett to come up and play, and, and I, I want you to respond to the message. I appreciate his, his uh, email sending uh, response actions that we can do, and that's the way it is in church. Every time you hear a message, there should be a response on our part when we hear the preaching of the Word of God. Can I get an amen? And so, like, I'm listening to him, and I'm thinking, how many of us in here have let go of a dream? Especially the older people. How many of you, know, you've had these dreams when you were younger, and it hadn't worked out yet, so you kind of give up on your dreams. Don't give up on your dreams. Who put the dreams in your heart? If God put the dream in your heart, it's going to come to fruition. Don't give up. I believe God has called every one of us for specific purposes and specific reasons. And it's not an accident that you were born in this time frame. And I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how young you are. It's not an accident that you're on the earth today. God has given you special giftings and callings, and it's because the culture that we live in needs the gifts and callings that God has given us to reach them. And so I want to encourage you. <clears throat> got a dream in your heart and you squelched it let that thing be rebirthed today so while she while she plays this morning let's respond to God let's say God here am I I am here I am willing take my two loaves and or two fish and five whatever it is whatever I've got take no matter how small it is take what I've got and use me to further your kingdom can I get an amen 
You come while she plays. In Jesus' name, we pray. Somebody say glory. glory. You may be seated for just a moment. I feel like 
Well, first of all, I want to take an offering. I, how many of y'all were blessed by today's message? Uh, I want to take an offering for uh, Curtis and his family, but also you can, if, you, if, you're, if you're inclined to, you can buy stuff off the table. Now, I've watched The Masters of Deceit, and I'm telling you, it's as well-made and meaningful movie as you will ever watch for the days in which we live. So I feel like everything on that table is going to be that way. So if you want to buy something out there, I'm going to buy that $99 thing because I think that's a little bit of everything, right? That sounds like a great deal to me. Um, but if you want to just give offering, uh, you can do that too. And So uh, come on up, guys, with the plates. Uh, and I'm going to try to encourage you while they're passing the plate. But let's pray first. Uh, if you didn't learn anything else today, you should learn the importance of prayer and fasting. Amen. So, Father, right now we thank you for Curtis and his family and uh, the ministry that you've given him and the incredible things that you've already done through his life. And, uh, Lord, I ask you to use the work that you put into him to save America. I believe you created America for a purpose and a reason, and the devil has got more than a foothold right now. And so we ask you, Lord, to expose and remove all those who've, evil folks who have rooted themselves in high places. Expose them and remove them in Jesus' name. Raise up godly men and women to run for every office in this country from the smallest level to the highest. Because the Bible says that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. And when evil rules, people moan. And Lord, we're living in a day and age where there's a lot of moaning going on. And we ask you to change the course of America that you can use her to further your kingdom in these last days. We ask you, Lord, to bless this offering, to use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you can give cash or check. If you write a check, write it out to Trinity Family Church. If you want to give online, uh, text to 73256. Text TFC Forney. And there's a, it, it defaults to tithe. If you'll click that drop-down button, uh, select special offering or love offering, whatever it is, and uh, give to that, and we'll know that goes to Curtis and his family. But while they're passing the plates, I, I just really believe somebody in here needs to hear an encouraging word that your gift is not too small. Whatever you have is not too small. Um, every year at Christmas, they play Little Drummer Boy. Y'all remember Little Drummer Boy? I cry to this day every year when I hear that. Because in the song, he says, all I have is my drums. And he, and he offers a song to the king with his drums. That's all he's got. You think Jesus can't take a drum and use it for the kingdom? I mean, it doesn't matter, huh? He can take a hallelujah. We just sang that. Uh, I'm telling you, it's the devil that tells you you're too small, you're too little, you're nobody, uh, you have no influence, uh, your gifts are minuscule. That's the devil. Jesus can take whatever he gives you, no matter how small it is, and use it and magnify it to further the kingdom. Don't be afraid to step out and use your gifts. Step out in faith. Uh, I was talking to somebody this morning. I said, you know, every, every, they said something. Uh, uh, I asked them how they was doing. They said, uh, I can't remember exactly what they said. Something like uh, fairly okay or something like that, you know. And I, I said, listen, every time somebody asks you how you are, you say, I've never seen a better day. Because you refuse to live according to your circumstances. You're living by the faith and the promises in the Word of God. My circumstances aren't the same every day, but my answer is always the same. I've never seen a better day. Because this is a day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, so we got to ask ourselves sometimes, do we believe what we preach? So as a preacher, I'm telling you, God has put all kinds of things on me over the years. Uh, I believe what I preach. Amen. I believe the Word of God. I believe the promises of God. And I want the confession of my mouth to be the, the belief that I have in the Word of God. Transformation has to take place in our lives we got to go from being who we were to letting Jesus have his way in us and changing us and molding us and making us more like him. Do you think Jesus moans and complains? Do you think he's sitting up in heaven right now looking at it? Can you believe these people? I cannot believe they have let this get to this place. Do you think that's Jesus? 
Jesus saw it all coming. He, nothing catches him by surprise. You realize the Bible says he has seen the end from the beginning. He's already seen this. <clears throat> he's not finished with you. He's not finished with me. And I don't believe he's finished with America. But we all have to do our part. Listen, it may seem minuscule to you, but it doesn't matter. He mentioned the guy sitting on the curb. Have y'all ever heard the story about the boy with the starfish? He's walking down the ocean uh, beach, and there's all these starfish that have been washed up on the shore. He starts picking them up one at a time and throwing them back in the water. But there's thousands of them. It's just one little boy. And another little boy comes by and says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm putting the starfish back. He said, son, you can't even put a dent in it. You're wasting your time. You're not making any difference at all. And the little boy said, I made a difference in that one. I made a difference in that one. And I'm telling you, no matter how small your gifts are, everything you do for God is multiplied. He makes it work. You are making a difference. Don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you you're not making a difference. You are. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, stand back up. Yes. Yeah. Um, some of y'all know that I've been, I was sick the last week to 10 days or whatever and had to fight through it. God is good, and he delivered me out of it very quickly, even though the doctors didn't think that that was possible. So I'm standing here as a testimony to that. But <laughs> thank you, Jesus. But I've also been saying a lot lately that I'm tired of the devil beating up on my friends, my family, my family here with sickness. I'm tired of it. I've had it. And I'm tired of every time we turn around, somebody else is sick. Somebody else is fighting it. So because I believe the word of God that says we fight from victory, not for it, I would like Miss Diana to come down here. And I would like Miss Scarlett, if you would, to come down here. And I want the prayer warriors in this house to come and lay hands and agree that this sickness cannot come around again. It is not going to make rounds through here again in Jesus' name. Let's do it. <laughs> 